I have, this sounds a little trite, but uh, it's true. Uh, one of my favorite uh, movie series is the James Bond series with Daniel Craig, all right? So if I had like a sick day series, like if I was sick and I was at home and I was going to be in bed and like there's something I'm going to throw up that's just like a guilty pleasure, I would turn on James Bond, right? Daniel Craig specifically, right? He just gets in that suit. He's so cool, you know? He has all the cool cars and all the cool gadgets and it's just, I, I love it. So Usually in these movies, Bond, he gets into these interactions with his nemesis and he has these witty one-liners that he says. And there's been one that has been in my head as I've been thinking through this text specifically. It's in the fourth movie, Spectre, if you remember it, if you've watched it, I don't think I'm going to spoil anything as I share this. If it does, it's like been out for since 2015, so it's on you. But Bond is chasing down his nemesis. He finally catches him, and there's this interaction that happens with his nemesis. And so it goes something like this, all right? He gets there, and Bond comes in, and he's, like, all serious. And then he gets into the conversation, and things like the tension just seems to, like, fade away, and he gets into this, like, silly mood. And so the guy's like, why did you come here? And Daniel Craig, or James Bond, says, well, I I came here to kill you. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, things escalated really quickly. And so the, the nemesis replies back, I thought you came here to die. And Bond, with his witty one-liner, says, well, it's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> you can just imagine it as like British accent saying it, can't you? I can. Maybe you can't. Um, well, as we're coming to our passage tonight, that last little phrase, it's all about perspective, has been what's stuck with me. Because I think if you look at our passage tonight, you could say that, minus all the murder vibes that are going on in that interaction, um, that it's all about perspective, all right? So Paul, he's closing out a section in his letter to the Galatians, and he's ending with a final plea here, all right? And we see it in verse 9 says this, but now since you know God, or rather have become known by God, how, you can turn, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elements? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? So it all comes down to perspective and how you read this. So usually we read this from the Galatians perspective, don't we? We read this from the Galatians perspective as those that are receiving the letter. And that makes sense. I mean, Paul's writing this letter to a church. We're a church, so we receive it as a church. You also, getting this from a church authority, Paul, the Holy Spirit is writing this through Paul. And so we, as those that are under authority, we read this as those under authority. But look, if you read this from Paul's perspective, it gives us an entirely different perspective on it. From the Galatians' perspective, this is a gospel rebuke. From Paul's perspective, this is gospel ministry. What he's doing here is he's ministering to the people in Galatia, the churches of that area. He's doing gospel ministry to those that have strayed away from the good news of Jesus. We see this in 2 Timothy 4.2 as he's writing to his protege, Timothy, about what it looks like to carry out ministry. Here's what he says. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. So if you take Paul's perspective of what all is happening here in the book of Galatians, it's gospel ministry. Paul is ministering to the Galatians. And that's the perspective that I want us to look at this passage with tonight. And I, there's a couple of reasons why. One, I think it's relevant. And two, I think it's needed. It's relevant and it's needed. Here's, here's how it's relevant. Every person that has responded in faith and trust in Christ, the Bible repeatedly says that you are now a minister of the gospel. Everywhere. You look at all Paul's letters, you look at Peter's letters, what does it regularly say? It says that you are now a minister of the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul illustrates this for us. He calls us ambassadors. What do ambassadors do? They are those that have a personal message that are representatives from a different country in a foreign land that are proclaiming this particular message. And Paul says that message for us is a message of reconciliation that you can be made right with God through faith in Christ Jesus. We are all ambassadors that we've trusted in Jesus. You see this with Peter too. He says that we are a royal 
priesthood. What did priests do? They ministered the word of God to his people. We're all a royal priesthood. If we've trusted and believed in Jesus Christ. But even more importantly than that, you get this from Jesus himself. If you look at the end of all the Gospels and even the beginning of the book of Acts, what we regularly think of as a great commission where we're to go there for and make disciples of all nations. Well, every Gospel ends that way. Every Gospel, it's not as maybe explicit as at the very last words of the Gospel of Matthew, but every Gospel ends with it and the beginning of the book of Acts begins with it. Go and make disciples. It's all over the place. You've been given the ministry of the gospel if you've trusted in Jesus Christ. We're all ministers of the gospel, so it's relevant. But secondly, it's also needed. Because whenever I've, I hear this, maybe you feel this with me, when I hear that I'm a minister of the gospel, I usually have two reactions. One, I'm scared. And second, I'm timid. I'm scared because I don't know how people are going to react. When I go share, when I go serve, whenever I go show people my life and trying to follow Jesus, it's, it can be terrifying. Where do I start? What does it look like? But secondly, we're timid because it's, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, it paralyzes us, doesn't it? When we think about being ministers of the gospel, we're like paralyzed. We don't know how to, like where to take the first step. What does it look like for me to end relationship with people, be a minister of the gospel? Well, here's the good news. <laughs> As we look through this particular passage, Paul teaches us a lot about being a minister of the gospel. Here's three particular ways that I want us to look at how Paul teaches us what it looks like to be ministers of the gospel. First, he shows us what the burden of gospel ministry looks like. We're going to look at that. We're going to wrestle with it. He's going to show us, secondly, how we take opportunities as ministers of the gospel. And then third, he shows us what the purpose of gospel ministry is, which answers so many of these questions. When it comes to our fear, when it comes to our timidity, this speaks into both of these things in a very extraordinary way, which is so needed. So here's what I want to do. Here's how I want to tease this out. I want to do a show and share, all right? I want to show and share. I want to go to these parts of this passage to show you where you see burden, where you see opportunity, where you see purpose. And then I want to share modern day examples just from my own life, people that I've seen in my life that have modeled this for us. So maybe it can give us a mental picture and a vision for how we carry it out in our own personal life. So we're going to show and we're going to share and then we'll end hopefully with some compelling vision for us. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with burden of gospel ministry. That's what we see in verses 8 through 11. So let me just read this for us, refresh our minds, and then hopefully I can pull out and extract some things that show us where the burden comes from. So here's verse 8. But in the past, since you didn't know God and you were enslaved to those things by nature that are that by that by nature are not gods sorry about my tongue confusion but now since you know god or rather have become known by god how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elements do you want to be enslaved to them all over again you're observing special days months seasons and years i'm fearful for you that perhaps my labor for you has been wasted so let's connect this to previous weeks, all right? He's continuing, Paul's continuing his argument from previous weeks. Galatians have strayed from the good news of the gospel. They've trusted or believed and followed with practice what false teachers have come in and shared with them, that it's Jesus and, not Jesus alone. It's Jesus and circumcision, so becoming a ritual Jew, and then also customs of the Jewish law. So you're you're continuing the practices of the Old Testament in modern day life. It, these things are required in order for you to be accepted as the family of God. That's what these false teachers are coming in. Paul's saying, no, 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 it's Jesus alone. His life and his work 
are sufficient. Whenever you trust in anything or add to the gospel, all you do is you enslave yourself. That's what Paul is saying here. He says that the law, it only exposes your sin problem. It can never truly address it. What the law is, it's like the mirror in your bathroom. It just points out the flaws in your body, but it is weak and worthless, and it has no power to actually address the blemishes that you see on your own body. That's what the law is. So as Paul is reminding them, hey, don't go towards these additions to the gospel. Keep going down the path of Jesus alone. What you see in the midst of his language is burden language. You see burden in Paul's language as he's writing to the Galatians. Here's what he says. Let me just point out a few of them. He says, how can you turn back? I mean, if you, if you put yourself in Paul's shoes and you've ministered to these people, he's writing with a certain perplexity here as he's, how can you turn back? These things that you're now trusting in compared to what I came and initially shared with you, how could you turn back? He also, I'm fearful for you. I'm fearful for where you're headed. Perhaps my labor for you has been wasted. I mean, this is burden language. Paul does not write to the Galatians with this dry tone in his final plea. No, he's drenched with burden for them. And this is where gospel ministry starts, is you have a burden for people. You have to stop and recognize that Paul's burden has an orientation. His burden is oriented to a particular people. So here, obviously, it's the Galatians, but we also know that Paul has a particular burden for Gentiles in his life. Anybody that is born outside of being an Israelite is what a Gentile is. And Paul has this particular burden for these people. We saw this in Galatians chapter 2, that Paul has this particular burden we saw that Paul entered into a special meeting when he went back to Jerusalem and he met with some of the big A apostles, James and Peter and John, people that witnessed the resurrected Jesus, had a particular call to go share the good news of Jesus, start churches across the globe. And the result of this meeting was a handshake where Paul uh, and James, Peter and John, they shake hands and Paul Uh, or sorry, James, Peter, and John, they tell Paul, you go to the Gentiles as we go to the circumcised Jews. There's a burden in Paul's heart. Now the question is, how how do we get that? If Paul has this burden, how did he get his burden? And then how did he cultivate it? All right, so if you can with me, um, Imagine you're in a movie and you're going to a flashback, all right? We're going to a flashback scene. So imagine you're going back in Paul's life. If modern day, he's like got the Justin Bieber haircut or something. I don't know. And so he goes back. We go back to Acts chapter 13. And here's what we see. Um, the way that Paul gets his burden and the way that it's cultivated is through his personal experience. Because where we find Paul in Acts chapter 13 is he's in Antioch. He's at the church of Antioch, which is known as the first Gentile church in the New Testament. And the way that Paul is called to go to the Gentiles is in the midst of a prayer meeting. So here's what you need to recognize. Here's what we need to recognize here is when you look at Acts chapter 13, Paul is building relationships with people that are non-Jewish, non-Israelite people that have trusted in Jesus, and he's like in the dirt with them. He's in deep relationship with these people. He's he's sharing life with them. He's been there for years. He's doing life ministry. He's seen the work of the gospel take root in these men and women's life. He's deeply steeped in relationship with Gentile people. And as they are coming together as the church and they're praying together at a prayer meeting, God calls out Paul and Barnabas to go to the Gentiles to share the good news of Jesus. And this is the same way that burden is cultivated and is found in your life too. You look at your life and where do I have relationship? 
and you also stop and think about prayer. It's, it's through relationship and it's through prayer that you get burden and the cultivation of that burden to go and minister the good news of the gospel to people. That's where Paul finds it, but look, that's where we find it too. I have a friend, um, uh, two friends that did this really well, all right? So that's the show. Let me go to the share, right? Um, my friends are Dustin and Sherry, all right? So Sherry was a dental student, and she developed a really close relationship with some of those that were in her class in her dentistry school. So they would study together. They would be in class together. They'd be in lab together. They're in all these different places regularly and Dustin and Sherry began inviting these friends into their home. And as they shared life with them, as they built relationships with them, there was a deep burden that grew inside of them for these friends. I mean, we're talking about a very eclectic group. I mean, people from all over the world that were a part of this friend group, people from all different phases of life. You have people from all different social classes that were a part of this group regularly coming over to their home. And as they built relationship with them, I also saw their burden grow and increase for them because I saw them regularly pray. They regularly prayed for these friends that were coming over to their home with regularity that Sherry was regularly in relationship with them. And as I, I saw this, like, because I would meet with Dustin for coffee meetings pretty regularly. And so he would come and we would take time. We would share life with one another. We would share updates about what was going on. We'd always try to end with praying with one another. And every single time that we prayed, he's always praying for these friends by name, regularly. Now, here's the result of what happened. So I, as I walked with Dustin over about a year and a half, he saw over 15 of these friends place faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ. 15. I'm not just people that personally expressed, confessed relationship with Jesus. I mean, they made their faith in Christ public. They went and took their belief and put it before the life of the church. They were baptized. They shared their testimony. This is what life before Jesus looked like. This is how I came to know Jesus. This is what life with Jesus looks like. Took their faith public before the whole entire church. Look, because Dustin and Sherry had a deep burden for people that they befriended and prayed for. This is what happened in Paul's life, but it's what happened in my friend's life as well. So look, here's, here's what I want us to wrestle with as we think about this, all right? There's two things. What does it look like for us to grow a burden? First, you find who, who's your who? <laughs> find your who. So this is why I've brought to you like the idea of the five dimensions, all right? So I have them on the screen again. Here's what they are. Location, vocation, recreation, restoration, multiplication. Location is where you live. Vocation, where you work. Rest, rest or recreation, where you play. Restoration, where there's need. Multiplication, the next generation. These are all facets for you to find and think through who has God particularly placed in my life that I cultivate relationship with. And then secondly, that I start praying for. Who, find your who. Step in and cultivate the relationship. But look, then start praying. This is, this is what Paul did. This is what my friends did. Look, this is what we do. When you're a minister of the gospel, you grow burdened for people that don't know Jesus. And so you look at your life, who has God placed in my life for me to invest in that relationship and for me to regularly pray for them. And as you do, your burden for them will grow. So gospel ministry begins with burden. We find our who, and then we pray regularly, constantly, that they would come to know Jesus. But secondly, what we see about gospel ministry here from Paul is that he also seizes opportunities. So you have a growing burden. 
But then, like, what do you do with the burden? Well, you seize the opportunity, and that's what we see Paul do in verses 12 through 14. So here's what verse 12 says. I beg you, brothers and sisters, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have not wronged me. You know that previously I preached the gospel to you because of a weakness of the flesh. You did not despise or reject me, though my physical condition was a trial for you. On the contrary, you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. So here's what we see from Paul. He seized opportunities for gospel ministry here. We see this in two particular ways. One, he leveraged his gospel freedom for others. And then secondly, he embraced the circumstances of his ministry. All right, let me show you this. Verse 12, we see that Paul leveraged his gospel freedom for the Gentiles, particularly the Galatians here. He says this, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. What in the world are you talking about, Paul? (laughs) Paul simultaneously is declaring a gospel truth as well as a ministry practice. The gospel truth is that your acceptance does not come through obedience to the law, but through faith in Jesus. Paul, here's what Paul is saying. I practice this freedom that I have in Jesus among you. I became like you. You are observing laws or you're observing special days and weeks and months and years. Paul's saying, you didn't see me do that whenever I came to you. I practice the freedom that I have in the gospel knowing that it's only through Jesus that I truly can have right relationship with God. It was not through these special practices that you're doing in your life. I became like you who did not practice these special days. And so now he's saying, I want you to become like me as you've taken on these special practices, as you've taken on circumcision, as you've taken obedience to the Mosaic law, as the way into right relationship with God, Paul's saying, I've laid all that down. So now when I became like you, now I'm calling you to become like me. Gospel truth. But it's also ministry practice. Because Paul uses his gospel freedom to connect with people that are different from him. Paul leverages his freedom in the gospel. He's laid down all the things that he once built his life up on. He's laid all that down, and now he uses his gospel freedom to serve people. We see this in Paul as he's writing to the book or to the Corinthian church. Chapter 9, he says, I become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. Here's what Paul looks like. He looks like a chameleon. (laughs) What does a chameleon do? Like they can change their outward look to the surroundings that they're in for their own survival in life. Paul adapts and relates in order to share the hope of Christ with anyone and everyone that he possibly comes in contact with. So Paul says, different culture? Fine, I'm willing to lay down my preferences. I'm willing to adapt and to change and leverage my gospel freedom so that I can get into life with these people that I am in a different culture, different context with, different social class. I'll lay down my pride. If someone in terms of the everyday world is considered in a social class below me. I lay down my pride. Paul goes to prison for crying out loud. He's whipped on the back. Like his life is literally hanging in the balance as he goes in order to try to minister to any person that will hear the good news of Jesus. He lays down his pride. Even in the matters that are so small, things like how you dress, Paul's like, I'll lay down the robes and the tassels, right? Like, he's like, I don't care. I, I'll take up rags. If it means that I have opportunity to get into life with somebody, to share the good news of Jesus, I will leverage my freedom that I have in Christ Jesus so that I may minister to someone else. 
But not only did Paul leverage his gospel freedom, he also embraced his circumstances. We see this in verse 13. He says, you know that previously I preached the gospel to you because of a weakness of the flesh. This is referencing his initial visit to the region of Galatia. So as Paul went there, it's his first missionary journey. He goes there. The visit probably didn't go as he planned. What happens is there's intense persecution that's likely paired with sickness that's in his life. If not one or the other, then both. And it likely affected his eyes, as you see in verse 15, that Paul says, if possible, you would have torn out your eyes and you would have given them to me. So persecution or sickness or both affected his eyesight or something was going on that these Galatians would then be willing to give over their eyes to him. And what does Paul do though? He embraced his circumstances and he shared the good news of Jesus. And to Paul's surprise, the Galatians they received in verse 14, Paul says, on the contrary, you receive me as an angel of God and as Christ Jesus himself. Like this would have been shocking to him. As he's thinking through like, I'm this guy that's being persecuted and I have immense sickness and I would just, I almost came across as a burden to you. I was surprised by how well you received me. So even in the midst of his circumstances, like Paul is still coming and sharing the good news of Jesus in his weakness. And he's surprised by the response that he gets. And here's why I think this is so worth like sharing is because I think it's so relatable. When we think about our life, so you maybe think about your, like where you're at sitting in your seat right now, you're like, yeah, this doesn't feel like things went as I thought they would either. I mean, you, maybe you came here for school and when it comes to your work or your fellowship or your residency or whatever's going on, it just, it doesn't feel like it's going quite like you envisioned. It just, it's been a struggle. You're questioning things. Is this the path that I still go on? Do I need to change up my major? Do I need to change my career path? You're just, it doesn't feel like things have gone the way that I thought. Maybe you grew up here and some of you, you had like visions and dreams that like I wanted to get out and stretch my wings beyond the Midwest and go somewhere else. But then you find yourself here. And you're like, how did I, how am I still here? Why? Some of you, you moved here to be a part of starting this church and things just haven't gone the way that you thought. I mean, it's just been an incredible struggle, whether it be physically, whether it be relationally, like you have all these things that are going on. You're just like, God, I followed you here or like you've kept me here and I, I, it just hasn't gone the way that I thought. What we see from Paul is, Paul is like, yeah, <laughs> This is kind of the way that God works, though. God takes what is weak in the world, and he uses what is weak in the world to expound and show just how great and good he is. So as you look at this, Paul's like, yeah, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised that things haven't gone the way that you thought. Instead, be like Paul, and you embrace your circumstances in the hand that I have been dealt with, I'm going to make known the excellencies of Jesus. So here's the question for us. Well then, like, what does this look like? How do we, how do we leverage our gospel freedom for others and embrace our circumstances? Here's the answer. Sacrificial service. Sacrificial service. It's in sacrificial service that you lay down your desires, your preferences, and you leverage your gospel freedom for the sake of other people, and you do it no matter what circumstances that you're in in the present tense. It's not just like when things get better, I'll change it up, and then I can step in and I'll embrace the gospel opportunity. No, it's where you're at right now laying down your preferences to serve other people. Now, you may think, that sounds like no fun. <laughs> like, like here's, here's the equation that we have for joy in this life. Our equation for joy is my preferences 
with situational comfort that equates joy. When I get to do everything that I want to do and my circumstances are good, I'll finally be happy. Now here's God's paradoxical math of joy. Your joy is not rooted in your circumstances, but in the person of Jesus Christ, who is forever seated at the right hand of God. So it's not dictated by your circumstances, it's firmly rooted in a person. And then it's also sacrificial love, love towards God and love towards your neighbor. And when you are rooted in Jesus and not your circumstances, and when you live sacrificially in love towards God and other people, here's what happens. You find joy. Sacrificial love. I have a friend that I, I don't, I aspire to be him. I, honestly, I, I came from a church that planted churches, came and started, tried to do things like what we're trying to do here. Um, and the pastors that I was with, um, I learned a lot about like a desire and a passion and what the Bible actually says about starting new churches from them. But I think I actually learned how to plant a church from my friend Nathan, because here's what he did. He was such a model of sacrificial love. He leveraged his gospel freedom for other people. And then he embraced his circumstances. He, le- he was a guy, he was brilliant, brilliant guy. Yet, he bought a house in one of the poorest neighborhoods, strategically, so that he could share life with people of very different upbringings than what he did. He went in, and here's what he would do. He would, he would lay down. He was not a guy that liked sports. <laughs> he, he was kind of quirky. He was a little socially awkward at times. But he, here's what he did. He would regularly have uh, Saturday, Sunday night football parties over at his house. He didn't care about football whatsoever. But you know who did? His neighbors. His neighbors cared about football. He would invite them over. They had Sunday night football at his house almost every single week. He embraced their teams. One of his, the, the teams that his friends liked were the Eagles, and so he became an Eagles fan. He had Eagles gear. He, got, he didn't know a single player. <laughs> he, did, he had no idea. He, but he leveraged his freedom, laid down his preferences to step into the life of those that he was around. But look, his life didn't end the way that he thought. He thought he was going to go down a road of being a world-class businessman. He got betrayed in a business deal, backstabbed, that that he literally had to move for his own personal security that landed him in this particular area. And life just wasn't going the way that he thought. But look, he leveraged his gospel freedom for others and he embraced his circumstances. And y'all, the testimonies that came out of the relationships that he built with people on his street in the city were astounding. People that literally would come up to Nathan and say, if you didn't live here, I have no idea who I would be. I have no idea what my life would look like right now if you weren't living two doors down from me. Four, do- four doors down from me. Five doors down from me. I mean, people are like, my marriage would be done. I would be in some halfway house. I mean, just the stories that came out, all because he leveraged his gospel freedom for other people and he embraced his circumstances. He stepped in and seized the opportunity. And so look, for us, it's, the answer is sacrificial love. How is God calling you to leverage your gospel freedom for someone else's benefit and to embrace your present circumstances and start sharing the good news with somebody now? You serve your way into their life and you give witness for the reason that you are the way that you are. That's what it looks like. You seize opportunities. So the last piece of gospel ministry that we learn from Paul here 
is purpose, and we see this in verses 15 through 20, all right? So here's what it says. I promise I'm getting close. Where then is your blessing? For I testify to you that if possible, you have torn out your eyes and given them to me. So then I have become your enemy because I told you the truth. They court you, speaking of these false teachers that have come to Galatia, talking about Jesus and circumcision and the Mosaic law. They court you eagerly, but not for good. They want to exclude you from me so that you would pursue them. But it is always good to be pursued in a good manner and not just when I am with you. My children, I am again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be with you right now and change my tone of voice because I don't know what to do about you. So you still see the burden. You still see the opportunity that's happening here. But here's what you see. You see the purpose of gospel ministry in verse 19. It says, my children, I am again suffering labor pains for you. Look, until Christ is formed in you. What's the purpose of gospel ministry? Is that Jesus, like his face and a wax seal would be imprinted in your soul. That you would look progressively more and more like Jesus. Now the motive you see between Paul and these false teachers is entirely different here. We see this in verse 17. Paul says, they court you eagerly, but not for good. They want to exclude you from me so that you would pursue them. So false teachers... They would try to come in and they were trying to gain a following. They're trying to gain a following. They're trying to exclude them from Paul. Don't listen to this Paul character, but follow our teaching. They're gaining a following. And here's what would happen in this day and age whenever you followed somebody. You would follow them in order to become like them. You would have this vision that they would place before you to become almost like a mini version of them. So these false teachers had this desire to make many versions of themselves, but look, Paul's different. He says, I want you to be many versions of Jesus. Now you may say like, well, Paul elsewhere says, imitate me. So isn't he just doing what these false teachers do? Well, let's go to the actual text. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, imitate me, but look, as I also imitate God. Paul's saying, not, he's not saying, come imitate me because I want you to become miniature versions of me. He's saying, come be like me, imitate me, because as I am trying to follow in Jesus' footsteps, as I want Jesus to be formed in me, hopefully I model the way for you and what it looks like for Christ to be shaped inside of you. Completely different motives. The purpose is that Jesus and the gospel shape your life and nothing else. Now, how do, you, how do you do this, right? Like, if you look at your life and you've ever seen a way that you've been shaped, it always, how does that take place? Like, how do you get to this place? It, it never seems to happen overnight. Like, we live in this microwave culture and you're just like, man, I just want, like, why don't I look different? Why don't I look like Jesus? Like, if this is true, then like, what, why, are, why am I not where I want to be at this present time? Like, why is it taking so long? Here's how you get there, is you're persistent. You're persistent. The way that Christ is formed inside of you is taking the long road, not the short road. And over time, what you'll notice is progressively, month after month, year after year, as you follow Jesus, as your purpose is to seek after him, you are made more and more like him. Now, here's what Paul is doing. Paul is saying, I'm persistent and working in order to see Christ formed in you. I labor as a mom that is in birth. Mom that's in birth never wants to keep a baby inside of her. She's always wanting to multiply out. Like she wants the baby to get out of there, right? I've seen this happen four times. Cheers never once did I say, yeah, keep the baby in. No, she's like, get that baby out of here. Paul's saying, look, I want to see Christ in the work of the gospel multiply many versions of Jesus 
and I labor, I work, I am persistent to see this take place. You see this here. You see this with Paul and his whole entire life. Look, Paul regularly shares how much he prays for the churches that he's gone to, been a part of planting or has gone to visit personally. He regularly says, I remember you in my prayers. I mean, you can't pick up a book of Paul that he's written to a church where he doesn't say that he's regularly praying for them, that he's wrestling for, for them in prayer. You see this regularly with Paul. He says that he goes into these churches and he establishes pastors. Why? Because he wants to see the good work of the gospel move forward in the life of the church body. Pastors are the ones that are calling them to the good news. They're the ones that are fighting for the truth. They're the ones that are encouraging and rebuking and exhorting people to remain faithful to the gospel. So he establishes pastors because he wants to see him over the long haul, head down the right path. He's writing them letters for crying out loud. He's regularly, as he's writing these letters, sharing, I wish I was with you in physical flesh and blood. I wish I was there with you. That I could share my life with you. That I could continue and relate. Like Paul is regularly persistent with those that he has ministered to. Jerry and I have a friend, Kelly, who modeled this just tremendously in her life. So we actually got to see her again this past summer. And Kelly has always been somebody that has been a great gatherer of other ladies and work, like pursuing them in relationship, going and having fun with them, life on life that's taking place. But then also each time that she's with people, she's like always working conversations towards Jesus. She's regularly like, I mean, in the, the context of personal relationship, in the context of deep devotion, in the context of longevity, Kelly is regularly good at pointing people towards Jesus. Why is she doing that? Because she wants to see Jesus formed inside of people. Like she's working through books with people, like doing, like she's book clubs with some of these ladies. I mean, she's now investing her life into moms, single moms with kids and like regularly just like, Man, I, I, she's doing everything that she can. Like, I've, I've heard from her. My parents have heard from her. Like, she's trying to gather opportunities, resources, things, just so that she can leverage all of it to point these women and these kids towards the good news of Jesus. Look, she has done this for well over a decade. Talking with her this past summer, like, she's bringing up names that I can remember 12 years ago that she was in relationship with, pursuing relationship, pointing them towards Jesus. She was telling us stories about life examples of things that are happening in her life in those relationships where Jesus is being formed in their life. Kelly's persistent. So look, here, here's what Paul teaches us about gospel ministry. It begins with a burden that starts through relationship and prayer for those people that God has placed in your life. And then leveraging your life, taking, seizing the opportunity by leveraging your gospel freedom and embracing your circumstances where God has you today in order to sacrificially serve other people, share the good news of Jesus, and then you do it over the long, persistent road of life. That's gospel ministry. That's what we learn from Paul in Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. Now, here's a, let me kind of bring this all together and we'll, we'll wind down, all right? Although one of the regular questions that I get is, um, and you probably have this too, I wrestle with this question. It's not just something I get. It's like, yeah, that's a great question. Why, why is that the case? And it's this, like, how did the gospel spread so rapidly in the early church? Essentially, the question is, like, why isn't what was happening then happening now? Like, what's the reason? Well, what happened in the early church is that you saw normal, regular, everyday people embrace that when they stepped into relationship with Jesus, that they became ministers of the good news of the gospel. And the result 
is what we see in the early church, which is just so powerful. It's so powerful. When you read the book of Acts, let me just kind of prove this to you, all right? So when you read the book of Acts, it's pretty shocking how the author of Acts, which is Luke, shares with how the good news of the gospel spread. So you go to Acts chapter 8, the first time that the gospel leaves Jerusalem, it doesn't leave with the apostles. There's persecution that happens. And what happens is you see people, normal, everyday people that most of their names aren't remembered. They are pushed out of Jerusalem and they go to Judea and they go to Samaria and the good news of the gospel is shared. Not the apostles, the apostles stay. The good news goes out with normal, everyday people. Then you get to Acts chapter 11 and 13. You get the church of Antioch, the first Gentile church. We don't even know the names of the people that started this church. Paul's there. Like he's called and he's set apart to be an apostle, but he didn't start the church in Antioch. It's just normal, unknown men and women that share the good news of Jesus, and then you get this missional force of a church that's planted in Antioch that literally leverages the mission of God throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Then you see that the gospel advances all the way to Rome. I mean, you, you get Paul's letter to the Romans. You also see Peter writing to the church in Rome. Like, you get these examples of the apostles, but they're not the ones that started the church. Who started the, the church in Rome? We have no idea. Normal, unknown, unnamed men and women that embraced the reality that they were ministers of the gospel. And what happens? Spread the gospel to the ends of the world. Like, <laughs> we ask the question because there's a deep desire that we have in our hearts because we're like, I want to see God do that again, right? I want to see God do that again. So the question you have to ask is like, well, how is he going to do it? The response is, he's going to do it through normal, unnamed, everyday men and women that embrace the reality that they are ministers of the good news of the gospel. That they declare who their who is. That labor in prayer. That leverage their gospel freedom. That embrace their circumstances. That sacrificially love people and are persistent in relationship with them year after year laboring to see the good news of Jesus shape their life. I want to be that church. <laughs> I want to be those people. I want to be, uh, guys, I've been praying. Like, I, I, I try to go out and, like, regularly, like, walk and pray just because I can't sit still. <laughs> and, like, one of the things I've been praying is, like, God, would you just do it again? Would you do it again? Would we be people that like in the historical record of humanity, like our names are not remembered, but that we would get to be a part of seeing you do this outbreak here in our city and then beyond where we see the good news of the gospel taken to the ends of the earth and what is recorded at the beginning of the book of Acts that daily people were being added to the numbers. God, would you do that again? Let's be the people who are burdened, who are opportunistic, who are purposeful in being ministers of the good news of the gospel. Paul's modeled the way. May we follow in his footsteps. Let's pray.